Hi guys, I'm really uh, excited to see so many people here already. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to see what I can do to answer your questions. We're going to talk about some prehistoric pottery. Uh, here we go. Uh, looking at the chat here, Michelle Mooney, hello from Louisiana. Hi, I used to live in Louisiana, Michelle. Uh, Goblu Girl, hello from Michigan. Anthony M, hi. Uh, Rufus Petrufus? Are you in Venezuela or Germany? Because uh, you obviously can't be in both at the same time. Alex Mendoza, hello. Uh, Re M, how do you pronounce that? Re M, hi. JD, hello in Florida. Um, hydro abrasion. That sounds really complicated. I have no idea what that means, but the pit fire sounds fun. So uh, you know, put up some pictures later. I'd like to see what that is. Uh, hey, Leslie, greetings from the Four Corners. Uh, you're not too far away. If you could talk about burnishing tips for bone-dry pottery. Um, yeah, I usually burnish my pottery when it's leather hard. You can burnish bone-dry pottery, uh, but you have to wet. You have to wet a small area. Um, I can show you. I have a, I have a bone-dry pot here. This is the, the duck pot that I made for the Ancient Pottery Challenge, and, uh, and it is already burnished. Um, but if I was going to burnish this, if I wanted to... I would um, <clears throat> I would dip my finger in water, I'd wet a small area, and I'd burnish that area. And then I'd wet an adjacent area, and I'd burnish that area. And because you can only you can only burnish when it's at a particular stage of wetness. Uh, you get it too wet, uh, that slip or the or the clay is going to start sticking to your stone. Uh, so it's too wet if it's like that. Uh, if you're scratching the surface, and you'll see it, um, you know, then you're too dry. So. You want to find that in between. And so you'll just wet an area, work it, wet an area, work it, and work your way all the way around the pot with that wetting and burnishing. But my biggest advice on that would be uh, to not to not burnish bone dry, to burnish when it's still a little bit leather hard. Uh, a lot of the modern uh, southwestern potters, uh, say Pueblo potters, Mata Ortiz potters, uh, they, they burnish bone dry, uh, but that's because they use sandpaper. So um, they can form the pot let it dry, sand it, um, and then um, polish it. And they can get a lot smoother surface by, by sanding. Uh, because I'm trying to make prehistoric pottery, uh, you know, they didn't use sandpaper, so I'm skipping that step. I don't have that challenge of having to then burnish bone dry pottery, which makes it a little easier, but a little more complicated to get it smooth enough. Because the sandpaper is kind of a, a big help in getting it really smooth. Uh and then Melody Martin, hello. And Andrew, do you know anything about the effects of adding sand to clay when making Cobb adobe? Uh, yeah, so I, I do know a lot about adobe uh, architecture. Uh, this is probably specifically related to an adobe kiln that I talked about in a previous video. Um, any, any temper in your clay weakens your clay. Uh, the more temper you add to a clay, the weaker that clay body, the weaker the fi fi finished fired pottery is. Um, and it's exactly the same for adobe. So uh, any any sand or straw you add to that adobe is actually weakening it. Uh, it is not a strengthener, uh, but it helps it to dry more evenly, helps it to crack uh, less. So um, it's useful, it's important, but um, it is not. It does not add strength, and neither does temper. And you'll hear that a lot of times, you know, reading books uh, that temper is used to strength to add strength to pottery. It is not. It's the opposite. Um, sand or whatever you're using for temper weakens uh, the walls of your pottery and it's the same with adobe um yeah alex mendoza said i've inspired him and has been practicing but not doing great alex uh it's just a matter of practice 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 every time you fail uh you're learning you're getting better and i started this when i was a, a teenager and uh, i didn't have the advantage of youtube I, there weren't even any books about this uh, when i started it, it was just a lot of, uh, besides people that I talked to that told me things, which was the greatest teacher, but, uh, you know, failure and trying again and failure and lots and lots of practice is how I got where I'm at. And so um, you can do it, Alex. It's just a matter of, you know, a lot of times you hear people say, oh, you know, that he's a real talented potter. And, and some people have a natural talent at pottery or painting or something. That's true. But in a lot of cases... Um, it's not it's not so much talent as as practice so if you go someplace like mata ortiz chihuahua and like i don't know half the population are potters it's not just 
had they happen to be a very talented place, uh, it's really that uh, that's a way to uh, help them economically. And so young people start practicing pottery early and they get really good at it because they practice, 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 and they have good teachers. So anybody can do it with the right amount of practice. Um, if I understand correctly, when I fire pots, I need to bring them up glow, uh, glow red. How long do you need to stay that way? Uh, Alex, uh, I don't fire at night generally, so I, I'm not looking for that glowing red. You can't see that during the day. Um, I use, if you've watched any of my videos on firing, uh, I like to use either a thermocouple or a little infrared heat gun, and that works real good. Um, and they don't need a long soak. If I can get my pots up to 750 or 800 degrees Celsius, I'm good. Uh, if I can soak for a few minutes before it starts cooling down, that's good too, but... Um, just getting there, they're going to be okay. They're going to make earthenware if you get to that temperature. Uh, Angela, oxidized versus reduction. Why and how can they be combined to get that effect? Okay, uh, so first of all, there's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to what reduction is. Uh, in southwestern pottery, a lot of what we call reduction, like Maria Martinez black on black pottery, for example, um, is not actually reduced. Uh, it's, it's smudged, it's smothered. It, it's, uh, that's carbon you're seeing, it's not reduced iron. Uh, and a lot of people think it's reduction, but it's not. And the reason we know that it's not is, uh, have you ever seen some of those potters in San Ildefonso or uh, Santa Clara, some of those places where they make the black on black pottery, they will use uh, aluminum foil in areas, like on the rim or, or in little cutouts, uh, and they'll place it over the pottery before they fire it. And then when they pull it out, the areas that are covered in foil will be brown or reddish brown, and then the other areas will be black. If, if it was actually reduced iron, it would reduce everywhere because they were keeping oxygen out of everything, right? Uh, but it's but it's actually, um, it's carbon. It's smudging, not reduced. Uh, and the same way, there's another thing they do. They'll, they'll take a blowtorch, a little propane torch, and they will burn off that black in designs after the firing. Now, if it was reduced iron, you would not be um, burning the black away. It's carbon. That's what they're doing is burning it away. Um, so most Southwest pottery is not reduced at all. Um, prehistorically, uh, members pottery was all reduced. Uh, a lot of that Cibola whiteware, um, like Tularosa and stuff, a lot of that was reduced as well because that paint is actually iron. That it, You'll see areas where it turns red. You can refire it in electric kiln today and those black designs will turn red. Um, how they do that, nobody, literally, I, that I'm aware of, nobody knows how they were reducing pottery back in prehistoric times. Uh, but when you start a fire, when you do an outside firing, uh, it is reducing it first. Uh, in the first, you know, let's say that, let's say you fire over the course of a, uh, an hour, just, just, just for simplicity. Most of my firings are less than an hour, but let's say it lasts an hour. That first half hour is going to be reducing, and then it's going to slowly gradiate towards oxidation towards the end. So, when it first starts lighting, there's all that smoke and fumes coming up. Uh, that fire is actively combusting, lots of flames. Um, there's very little oxygen inside there for that pottery. And at that time, you have a reduction atmosphere. Uh, and then as that fire starts burning to coals, there's less flames, uh, there's less smoke. It starts slowly gradiating toward oxidation. And so at the end, when you have all those coals just sitting on top of that pot, you're in a good oxidizing atmosphere. Um, and so almost all outdoor firings have a combination of reduction and oxidation. So the, if you wanted to keep it, and this is, this is all hypothetical, if you wanted to keep it reduced, uh, let's say I was a, a member's potter or I was trying to make member's pottery, I would want to smother it at that point before it started oxidizing um, or at least before the iron started oxidizing. Um, now, when you're making, uh, let's say, Mesa Verde black on white uh, organic paint pottery, um, it's the same way. They let it oxidize to the point that if you pull those pots out if, or if you smother it too early, they'll come out all black. They'll all be covered with carbon, right, the pots. Um, but they let it oxidize to the point that it's burned all the carbon off of the pot before they smother it. So there is some oxidation. That's why Clint Swink doesn't call it reduction. He calls it limited oxidation because you're oxidizing enough to clean the surface up to make it look nice and bright, and then you're smothering it, keeping the oxygen out. So uh, it's it's kind of a fuzzy uh, gray area. Um, where are we at here? Uh, yeah, let's 
cool to see all these potters here. Cool music. Hello. The, the music isn't still playing, is it? I hope not. Uh, hello from Texas. Hello, Alex from Texas. Chris in Kansas. Hi. Um, I think it's Mitchell. Hello from Florida. Uh, Andrew. Hi from Minnesota. Greetings from Argentina. Hello, Leo Bizon. Hydroabrasion is a phrase I learned just means using a sponge to wipe away the non-shellac areas. Okay, interesting. Um, it, it sounds uh, more complicated than it probably is. Hydroabrasion sounds really, uh, you know, scientific and complex. Uh, when can we see the milk ceiling and the redo of the spoon? Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm getting ready to do the, on the Ancient Pottery Challenge, I'm getting ready to do the Oya. That'll be next. Um, I'm trying to make sure I have enough clay because I have to have a, a volume of clay ready before I do that. Uh, and then I'll do the ladle after that. Um, and the milk ceiling, I'm talking to Mott's Merman. I talked to him yesterday about it. I'm trying to get him to help me with it. And so he sent me a, a text message, no, maybe an email yesterday. And he said, call me when you have a minute. And I haven't. So after this live stream, I'm going to call Mott's and try to schedule that maybe for the next week or so. So for that milk ceiling video to come up pretty soon. Uh, it, it's on my. It's still on my agenda. It's still on my list. I'm waiting for Mott's. Uh, oh, uh, Bobby Silas is here. Hey, Bobby. Uh, hey, from South Carolina. I asked you about red clay paint and iron oxide. Uh, B J E. Hey, from South Carolina. Red clay paint and iron oxide. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you're asking me a question now though or not, uh, B J. So if if you do want. To ask a question about iron oxide, or maybe rephrase that. Uh, Andrew Prost, uh, thank you. I felt like sand weakening it too. It was hearing mixed messages. Yeah, you, you hear that sand uh, strengthens pottery stuff. I mean, you'll read it in books, and it's not true. Uh, Regina Carroll, how wet does clay have to be to use? Oh, uh, well, that's kind of subjective because different potters are comfortable working at different, you know, drynesses or wetnesses. So. Uh, a lot of people that throw pottery on a wheel, uh, they work a lot wetter than I work hand building, for example. So, uh, and then some people may work wetter or drier. And I, and I run into that a lot when I'm teaching a workshop. I'll find that a lot of the students, um, you know, they work at different levels of dryness. And some of those that don't have a lot of familiarity with clay, uh, their pot will be cracking and stuff. And, and they'll be like, oh, why does my pot keep cracking? And, and the answer is, well, you need, to, you need to work a little wetter. You need to keep your clay wetter. You're working too dry. So uh, some of it is subjective. Some of it is based on your clay body. So some clay bodies, you know, work better at different levels. But um, certainly enough that it's plastic. That's the key, you know, to making pottery, making sure you have plastic clay. Um, Leslie says, uh, actually, sandpapering, sandstoning might answer one of the questions. I've had, long had about prehistoric pottery. How did they get all the burnishing done before it dried? Especially with the higher humidity in modern houses, but we have no idea. Yeah, no. So, um, prehistoric times, uh, they were what I would think largely working outdoors. I mean, if you go inside of a, a reconstructed Pueblo room, it's pretty dark. Um, you know, it's not really a, a good working area. Even if you have a fire in there for light, um, it's, it's dim light. It's flickering dim light. So... Um, if I was making pottery in those times, I think I would prefer to do it outdoors. Um, and, and obviously my house, even today, uh, probably has a lot more humidity in it than one of those Pueblo homes in, you know, 1300. So um, you're dry, you have a drier atmosphere, and if you're working outside, you've got a little bit of breeze and stuff. Your pottery is drying out like crazy. Um, so, yeah, I, that's a good question, how they kept it moist. Um, now, there's a picture I have. I wish I had it with me. I'd show you. Um that was sent to me by Barbara Mills, who's an archaeologist at uh, University of Arizona, and at at Bailey Ruin, which is up near Sholo. Uh, it was a pottery production community, and they found in the floor, so the floor of the house, this is inside, comes up, and there's a hole, and they've got like a jar buried in the ground, right? And then they have a, a flat piece of slate, some kind of flat sandstone or something that can go over it. And down in that hole, there was a wet, chunk of uh, prepared clay. So they would get their clay ready, maybe knead it up, add the temper or whatever, and they could put it down in this hole in the ground and cover it up with a piece of slate and it would stay a lot moister. So I imagine uh, you could even put like a small pot down in that hole, keep it moist. 
The other thing I've thought about is a damp, like they had cotton cloth, so damp cotton cloth would work similar to like a plastic bag, uh, you know, around your pottery to keep it moist or to keep the air away from it. But it would have been a, a tremendous challenge, uh, especially making complex forms like that double jar or the ladle, things where you don't want it to dry too fast and have things break off. Um, it would have been very difficult to keep things moist or, or not to let it dry too quickly uh, without plastic bags, without, like you said, the humidity of a modern home is different than it would have been. So I, it's hard to imagine. You, somebody was posting on Facebook yesterday uh, that picture of the, it was two birds. It was like double bird jars and they had like a strap across the top. Uh, it was just phenomenal, just unbelievable, the, the complexity of that and making that in a, in a primitive setting. It just blows your mind. Um, Danny, I learned so much from Andy. This is the best, uh, says R.I. Is it Re or R.I.? Andrew Pross says, uh, so why do sources recommend using both sand and straw in Adobe? Um, no, uh, no, I, I, I do know something about Adobe. Um, I went to Tcrat, so look that up, Tcrat, T-I-C-R-A-T, I believe. And it's, it's, a, it's a workshop having to do with... Um, building but mostly um um reconstructing and preserving historic adobe homes and um and and straw uh, actually sand is better than straw uh, so sand and straw both are do the same thing they act as it's like temper so it's just like pottery like adding temper and you can use animal hair you can use cow manure as your temper um but those aren't the best uh, sand or like volcanic ash something like that is better because they don't make a porous a porous clay way straw or animal hair will burn out and leave a porosity to your pottery um, but it's the same with Adobe if you use straw um, it's not burning out obviously I mean it's a burned Adobe but uh, that straw can wick moisture inside the walls of your of your earthenware structure and moisture is the enemy of Adobe so with that straw as, a, as an entryway for moisture the walls aren't gonna last as long with straw, especially in a moist area, if you were like, you know, maybe farther east from here or something, than if you use sand, so keep that in mind. Uh, Coneover88, hi Andy, thanks for doing this. I've been using heated pine sap to fill cracks in my pieces. Any tips for helping the sap stick to the piece? Also, once it's there, uh, I can't fire it again, flammable. Yeah, I, I have no experience with that, although um, I would assume, you know, that they did something similar in, in prehistoric times, uh, filling those cracks with sap or, or something. So um, that's an interesting idea. I've never, I've never fiddled with it. So you're having trouble getting the sap to adhere to the pottery, huh? I wonder if it would adhere better if you got the ceramic damp before you added it instead of adding it dry. I, just an idea. I don't know much about it. Uh, Leo Bozen. I love your channel. I live in a place with a climate similar to yours in Argentina and inspired to try collecting my clay and make my ceramics. Good for you. Good job. Keep it up. Um, Tracy Spouse, so much to learn. Uh, Re, going. quick thoughts on Terra Siglata. I heard that it can burnish well as well. Yeah, so Terra Siglata is just, as far as my understanding of it, so I am not a, you know, studio-trained potter. Uh, Terra Siglata is just clay that has been refined, purified, through the levigation process, which I show in some of my videos. In fact, I have a video coming up a uh, week after next uh, that deals with levigation. Uh, and that's just that's just letting gravity separate clay and water. So you mix it up, you let the larger particles settle, you pour off those fine clay particles, you end up with a clay that's really fine, well purified. And then of course it'll take a polish better because it's finer particles. Um, and, and that's and that's my understanding of Terra Siglata. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, all of the slips I use, uh, you know, red slips, white slips, um, I usually uh, purify all those with levigation so that it's the same sort of thing. And, and, and even purified, some will take a polish better than others. Just it's the nature of the clay, uh, the shape, not just the size of those clay particles, but the shape of those particles. So clay particles, if you know anything about that, are like little plates, they're flat. But some are, you know, some are fatter than others. Some are a little more um, oddly shaped, and so they don't, they don't sit together good. There's spaces between them because they don't, they won't sit good. So the flatter those are, 
the better they'll lay flat and make a nice smooth surface. So uh, a lot of that has to do with the quality of the clay. Although, yes, purifying it through levigation will make it better. Um, have you ever used ash as temper? Uh, how did it go? Yes, not wood ash, um, volcanic ash. Volcanic ash is, is one of the best tempers you can use uh, because it's really, really fine. Uh, it's, it's never going to like have a little chunk sticking up in your clay. Um, and it's, it's inert in the firing. So because it came from a, you know, a very hot volcano, you can pretty much get it as hot as you want in your firing and it's not going to like expand, contract, you know, explode like some rocks will do in a firing. So, uh, it, it makes a great temper. Wood ash, no, I don't, I had this question recently about wood ash and, uh, I don't know where that's coming from. To me, temper is defined as a non-plastic material. You ever get wood ash wet? It's slippery. It, it would be plastic-ish. I don't think it would work at all, but uh, I don't know. Uh, where are we at here? Uh, thank you for the Q&A. Thank you for the Q&A, says Regina. You're welcome. Off topic, if you ever decide to try burning limestone. Oh, yeah, I've thought about that. I could do that in my little kiln, so... Um, it has been something that I've toyed with. Um, hello, great channel, says Pots and Paints. Thank you. JD, why is my manganese dioxide and hematite burning off during firing? I'm using a clay from the Suwannee River here in my place. Uh, it shouldn't. Burning, like burning away or just like not adhering to the pottery? If you're making paint out of minerals, it, manganese or, or hematite, limonite, anything, you need to add about 15 to 20% clay to that as a fixative because um, when, you, when you grind up a rock, what have you got? You've got powder, right? It's not hard, it's soft. If you paint that powder on anything, uh, like a pot, there's no reason why that shouldn't remain a powder after the firing. So you need some, a little bit of clay in there so that it'll turn hard in the firing. That's what the magical thing about clay is, is it hardens when it gets hot. So uh, if that's what's going on, add a little clay to it. Uh, re, I would never do a vid. Would you ever do a video where you try and make something from some clay someone collected? I have some Pacific Northwest glacial clay I collected based off your videos. I'd love to see. Ah, uh, you, you know, here's the thing is lots of people give me clay. People try to give me clay all the time. So I'm about up to here with like, no, I mean, I'm not fed up. I don't mean I'm fed up. I'm, I, I have a lot of clay that's been given to me uh, that I haven't used yet. So um, it might be an interesting video. If I did, I'd, I'd probably want it from something, someplace, you know, exotic, uh, you know, someplace far away, Hawaii, the Pacific Northwest, you know, maybe New England, some, someplace that was uh, different from the Southwest. But it might be fun. Uh, we'll think about it. But yeah, generally I discourage people from giving me clay because um, I've, I've got enough clay to try on my own. I, I really don't need more. Uh, BJ, my clay paint, I use red clay and iron oxide from keeps coming off in the fire. Huh. Um, if you take uh, red clay and iron oxide uh, and mix it, uh, it should harden in the fire. If it doesn't harden, add more clay. Keep adding clay until, I mean, the clay hardens in the fire. At some point, there's a, there's a percentage at which that mixture is going to harden in the fire. I usually shoot for, like I said, 15 or 20 percent. Uh, and perhaps you're not adding enough clay to your iron oxide, but my point of view. Um, what what you could throw with it? I don't I don't understand that. R I what you could throw with it? Farpoint Station two dollars. Thank you so much, Farpoint. Would uh, human poop work? <laughs> um, yeah, I I would I I. I I think what, what is valuable about cow manure is those little bits of, of grass. You know, if you've ever looked at cow manure, it's, it, horse is even better. It, they're little bits of, you know, there's little bits of grass in it. It looks like something that came out of a, you know, a, a lawnmower bag. And so those tiny little bits of grass are acting as temper. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time examining human waste, but I think it's a little smoother because, you know, we eat things that are ground up pretty fine, like flour and cheese and such. So... Um, it, it depend. It would probably depend a lot on the person's diet. Uh, Bobby, you, yeah, no kidding. Uh, Michelle, yuck. <laughs> Farpoint Station. I don't want to. I don't want it to go to waste. Well, um, I suppose there's more interesting things you could do with it, um, as far as fertilizer. I would think, but you know, 
disgusting. LOL. Gosh. Um. Uh, Anthony M says, I still have problems joining coils together. When I push down, the bottom layer deforms. If I push lighter, it does not combine. I get a huge line. Any tips? Um, yeah. So uh, when you're when you're com when you're pressing those coils together, uh, the point is, uh, well, it depends on the quality of your clay. So perhaps your clay is really soft. Some clays are soft, and I could see that you know pressing them together would cause the bottom to deform. I would just go with the deforming. I would press those together really good with that um, bonding pinch, connecting them really well, and worry about the deforming after it's attached. Because usually after you attach the coil, you still have to pinch it up and kind of shape it, form it. So uh, even if it deforms the bottom a little, um, I don't think that's gonna be a, as big a deal as not having it bonded well. So I would go ahead and uh, go ahead and let it deform a little bit and then deal with that after you get the coil attached. That would be my take on that. Um, how long should pots be fired? Um, I don't think there's a time on that, uh, Regina. It's a matter of of um, getting it up to temp. So with these low fire earthenware pottery, as long as I can get to like seven seven fifty, you know, I, I think I think it'd be fine at seven hundred even. I probably they're probably high sixties. I I could probably go six hundred and fifty, six hundred and eighty, somewhere in there. It's it's turning into earthenware. As long as I can get up there. Um, it's going to turn to earthenware. I, the soak, the longer you soak, the harder it might become. But um, I don't think there's a time limit. I, at least, you know, I've fired, I've fired in, uh, literally, I've fired in 15 minutes. So, uh, Chris in Kansas, I've tried to come up with Terra Sig using some Upland Wild Clay, but it's real hit or miss. It depends on the clay. It depends a lot on the clay. So you can have a dozen different clays from your area and experiment with all of them, and you might find only one or two that'll that'll make good terra sig so um just just experiment like i said it has a lot to do with the <clears throat> the particle size and the particle shape of those clays leslie uh for con culver's question uh, navajo pitch pottery is removed from the fire while still hot and then rolled in pitch oh okay so see i said maybe have it moist but maybe the idea is to have that pot heated up first and you could even it might not even have to be like right out of the fire hot maybe you could sit it around a campfire and just kind of rotate it so that it's warm all over and then apply it that's another idea uh andrew prof thank you again very helpful i'll check out that workshop david lloyd some guy made pottery out of the wood ash on his channel guy made pottery out of wood ash well yeah i don't know like i said i've never tried it i don't want to say it, it won't work uh because i've never tried it and you know there's a million things you can try. I've never tried it. It doesn't make sense to me just thinking about it, but and maybe it works. Uh, what about diatomaceous earth? Yeah, diatomaceous earth is a great temper. And, you know, if you're in an urban area where you can't really get out and collect volcanic ash or sand or something, uh, you can buy diatomaceous earth at most hardware stores. So, And it's super fine, uh, like volcanic ash. And it's mostly silica, so it's inert in the firing. It's not going to pop or do anything weird so yeah diatomaceous earth is great i actually have some diatomaceous earth mines uh near me here in southern arizona where i've gone out and collected and and used it that way um samuel walker hello uh thanks for the tip andy yeah okay i've used wood ash as a glaze did not work well for me i could not get enough hot enough when firing yeah i've, I've heard of wood ash used as a glaze uh jd that is what i did not do was add clay thank you oh good i'm glad that was the the tip you needed to get their uh, uh mineral paint to stick uh, samuel walker what group of natives did make that type of pottery are they still alive if not who are their descendants uh samuel uh which type of pottery are we talking about excuse me T uh, yeah just just let me know uh leave another message samuel and, and tell me what what type of pottery specifically we're talking about because uh i deal with a lot of different types of pottery here in the southwest and some groups are around and some groups are not most of them are um florin random crafts hi hello from romania last year we started doing ancient pottery and your videos are very informative i'm i'm glad thank you uh, i'd be interested in seeing what you guys are doing there in romania is it uh ancient romanian pottery because that would be fascinating 
Samuel Walker, what group of natives made that type of pottery? Are they still alive? Not who are their descendants? Um, yeah, same question again. I'm just, Samuel, if you're still there, what, which specific type of pottery are we talking about? Uh, David Lloyd, higher protein. Mm, not following. Farpoint Station, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Reed, did he say how long is too long for a pit fire? I missed it. Um, yeah, you can't, you can't too long it. Um, you can keep it going, but if you're if you're not if you're not increasing the temperature, then you're not actually um, you're you're not actually doing anything. As long as that pottery is heated all the way through, let's say let's say the pots are at 800 degrees Celsius, right? Uh, and they're fully heated. I mean, it doesn't take long for that temperature that 800 to get from the surface to the inside. There's three methods of heat transfer: conduction, convection, and radiation. So. Um, Convection is hot air moving around. That's the primary way pots get hot in a firing. Um, radiation, that's radiant heat. So when you hold your hand to a fireplace, you can feel that heat kind of hitting it. Or you can feel the sun's rays. That's radiant heat. Um, and that only works when the pots are in sight of the flames. Okay? Radiant heat. Conduction, that's when it travels. That's when heat travels to a solid object. Um, so if you leave your, your spoon... Uh, sitting in the in the beans on your stove and you go to grab the spoon handle and the handle is hot That's conduction that heat traveled uh, from the beans to the spoon and then up the handle, right? And that's the most efficient method of heat transfer So when the outside of your pot is 800 degrees Celsius It doesn't take long for 800 degrees Celsius to reach the middle of that pot. Okay, right? So let's say the pot is sitting at 800 degrees Celsius uh, in a fire um, I don't think I don't think leaving it for a long time is gonna be that much different unless you're unless you're increasing heat over that time. Uh, so I don't I don't think I don't think there's anything wrong with too long. You could leave it in there for an hour. You could leave it in there for two hours. There's, I don't think there's any harm. But I don't think you're doing anything either. But yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, Susan Hartle, good day. Thanks for sharing your information. About what temperature do you think Native American pottery was fired to? It, it varies a lot. So um, uh, archaeologists, well, you know, when you say Native American pottery, that's a broad, that's a very broad subject. Uh, so we've got, we've got living traditions here in the Southwest, right? We've got uh, Hopis who make pottery and Zunis and different Pueblo groups. And we've got the uh, Odom and uh, Maricopa down here in Southern Arizona. So there's different groups that make pottery today and we can go out there and actually, you know, measure temperatures in their firings. And that would vary from from culture to culture, uh, the temperatures they reach. And then there's prehistoric pottery. So like the stuff I'm making, I'm not trying to make modern Native American pottery. I'm trying to recreate prehistoric pottery. And so um, in, in, in some cases, archaeologists can do studies on those sherds and find out at what temperature they were fired to. Um, so it, it varies from culture to culture and throughout time. So, you know, the Hopis might be firing to a thousand degrees today, but maybe they fired to 1200 degrees in prehistoric times, right? Um, so it's hard to really answer that question. Um, the stuff I mostly work on, uh, Salada polychromes is my main focus. And then like uh, Maverick Mountain and, and that some of those polychromes that were made here in the Southern Southwest, say between about 1250 and 1450 AD, uh, they were probably fired in the 750 to 800 Celsius range. No, but it, like I said, it varies a lot. Um, Alex Mendoza, Mogion, I believe it is. Oh, uh, so Alex, your question. Uh, Samuel said, um, what group of natives did they... Oh, so Mogion Pottery. Um, yes, hold on. So um, archaeologists debate a lot about who the Mogion are or were. Um and you'll hear a lot of different ideas. Um, there's a really good book. I can't think of the name of it right now. Anyway, there's a really good book came out a few years ago. It's an archaeology book, and it talks about um, this archaeologist had the idea that the Zuni were the descendants of the Mogion, and uh, and he went to a lot of lengths to, to show this. And um, and I didn't think it was very compelling. Uh, I I thought there were a lot of holes in it, and it seemed like a lot of the archaeologists that contributed parts of this book also felt like that wasn't the case but it was it's a really good read because it looks at a lot of the evidence um, in my book uh, mud puzzles which is for sale on my website in case you're interested um, I make the case that the Mogion 
the descendants of the Mogollon are the Opata, which who live just south of here, down in Mexico, just just south of the border. You don't hear their name very much in, in the Southwest because um, they didn't live in the United States uh, historically. They were just down in Mexico, and so we hear a lot of we only scholars tend to focus only on those groups that live north of the border and not so much south. So uh, the Opata were just south of the border here in, in northern Sonora, just across just south of Arizona. And I think those were the descendants of the Mogollon, but uh, the, the jury is out. Uh, there is some interesting evidence uh, relating, uh, connecting the Tarahumara uh, down in the Sierra Madre of uh, Chihuahua, connecting the Tarahumara to the Membris and also Casas Grandes, which are Mogollon groups. Uh, it has to do with dental, uh, like tooth, uh, you know, archaeologists looking at teeth. I don't know much about it, so, but you might look that up. Time doesn't matter. It's the temperature. David Lloyd. Uh, Farpoint Station, $5. Thank you, Farpoint. Uh, if you were my professor, I feel like I would have finished my degree. Kudos for providing great education, inspiration, and sharing your passion. Uh, great. I, I appreciate that very much, Farpoint. Appreciate it. Um, that It's my passion, too, and that's 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 my motivation. You know, When I was a kid trying to learn this stuff, uh, it was really hard, and I hope to make it easier on people in the future. Does it matter if the diatomaceous earth is food grade? No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter at all. Like I said, I go and, and harvest it out in the desert at an old abandoned uh, diatomite mine. So it doesn't have to be food grade to, add, to use for, for pottery. Just buy it at a hardware store. Um, peace and love and hope. Hello. Hello, peace and love. Uh, Andrew Prost. I've seen that wood ash pot. It leaked water out of the bottom. <laughs> Anthony M. Do you have any knowledge about colonial pottery of the 17th and 18th century? If so, can you do a video on it? Oh no, I know nothing about it. Um, I've looked. I've been to some archaeological sites here in southern Arizona um, with with Spanish pottery uh, that they call majolica, uh, and so I I think I can I can spot it in the field, uh, but I don't know anything about how it was made. I think that majolica was being traded up from down in you know Mexico City area or something. Um. Samuel Walker, thanks, and yes, I think it is Mogion, like you said. Yeah, um, so there's a, yeah, there's, if, if you talk to archaeologists, you know, they will tell you who all the different, you know, they're pretty sure who the descendants of the Holocom are the O'odham. That, that's what they say, and, and I think that's pretty well established. Um, you know, the groups that, you know, we used to think of as Anazazi, today they're called Ancestral Puebloan, obviously are the descendants, are, are the ancestors of the Pueblo groups in Arizona and New Mexico, Hopi, Zuni, uh, you know, all the groups along the Rio Grande. It, it, it's pretty obvious. Uh, the Mogollon is the big question mark in Southwest archeology. span uh, and, and my book does deal with that some. Um, happy Friday, peace and love, yes. Uh, I think I'm gonna go film a video tomorrow, so I, I, might, I might be working this weekend. There's a visible line inside the pottery when broken. Is it not getting hot enough? A visible line inside the pottery. So maybe a spot where the coil wasn't attached well? I don't know. I don't know I have visible lines inside my pottery, so I can't I can't really relate. R.I., thank you so much for answering my question. You're welcome. Um, thanks, for, thanks for coming to the live stream today. I, I really, uh, somebody mentioned live streaming a long time ago to me, and I thought, Ah, what if I live stream and, and nobody comes? You know, that'd be the worst. So um, thanks for showing up today. I really appreciate it. Um, Chris in Kansas. Miss Peace and love. Have you done with smoking the glazes with sawdust and sand? Do you have any tips on that? Um, no, no. I, 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 in my firings, I generally try to avoid getting, you know, smoking my pots or getting carbon deposits on them. Um, I can show you a pot here that I fired and talk about it a little bit so like this is a, a little bowl that I fired it it's not really great but um, so usually I fire uh, I fire upside down over the coals and I'll place the pots on rocks so there'll be like three rocks holding the bottom up and then the fuel you know I, I stack over the pottery and then as it burns it falls on the pot and it leaves these what they call fire clouds these marks you know carbon deposits here's a really good one right right there and so you're leaving these fire clouds on the outside and, and that's 
that's okay. I, I'm okay with some of that, but like I don't want it all smoky, and and I usually try to avoid that because I want the colors to come out. I want that red to show, you know. And if it was all smoky, it wouldn't look so good. So, uh, in my in my pottery, I'm trying not to, you know, smoke it unnecessarily. Just a, maybe a little bit. Um, Michelle Mooney, try, thank you, Andy, for all the wonderful videos. I have to go for now, and we'll finish watching later. You are my wild clay hero and have learned so much from you. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Leslie, what? Not drinking Coke out of your mug you sealed in the video recently? You know, I was going to... I actually plan on drinking uh, coffee in my mug, which is right here. I was going to drink coffee in my mug for the live stream, and um, uh, it, it's Tucson in, in April, so by the time I was... By the time 9 o'clock rolled around, it was already warm enough on this porch that the idea of drinking a hot drink was not appealing, so I grabbed a Coke. I could pour the Coke into the mug, but I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, got, it's got some, like, cornmeal, uh, you know, starch stuff in here. I don't know if that's going to affect the flavor of my Coke. Uh, sometimes I can be a bit of a Coke snob. Like, you know, you go to a Circle K and you get a bad mix on your Coke, and you're like, ugh, I don't like this stuff. Um, Kristen Kansas, some prehistoric sugar cores are grayish or even black, which is not specifically from reduction. I like to fire fire longer to burn off the carbon. That's right, Kristen Kansas. Um, so, uh, I'll get, hold on. Oh, I'm making a mess. So here's, um, here's a pot I made recently. Uh, this was a test pot. So, uh, this was some new clay that I was testing. I made a little bowl and I actually broke it on purpose. Uh, and the reason I broke it is I wanted to see that carbon core in the middle. If you can see that, I'm not sure if it's focusing. It's focusing on my face. The thing is, this camera wants to focus on faces so bad. Um, there, you see the carbon core? Okay, so that grayish color in the inside of the pot, on the inside, so all clays have carbon in them. Well, not all clays. Most clays have carbon in them naturally. And, I mean, it's just because it's in the earth and, and you've got dead plant material and stuff just soaking down and getting mixed up with that dirt. That is the clay. And so when you fire the pottery, you're burning that off. You're oxidizing that carbon. It's burning out. Um, and that will, if you don't properly oxidize your pots, you can pull them out of the fire and they're all black. And that's because you didn't oxidize that carbon out on the surface. In this case, and in the case of most, um, you know, primitive pottery in the Southwest, um, it doesn't stay hot long enough to burn all that carbon out. Now, if you were going for like, you know, kiln-fired pottery and you, you were going to vitrify it, um, then that carbon could cause problems like bloating and such. But, but if you're making earthenware, it's not actually a problem. In fact, some people have suggested that that carbon can actually help seal the pot better than if you burned it all out. Um, so I'm not sure where we were going with this. Let's see. Um, some prehistoric shirt cores are grayish or even black, which is not specifically from reduction. That's right. Not redu it's not reduced. It, it's, uh, it's carbonized organic matter. Uh, JD, I'm using oak bark, and it reaches 1,200 degrees and also red cedar, and it only reaches 1,150. Wax myrtle gets even hotter. Great. Yeah, no, I, uh, we have a lot of live oaks here in, in um, southern Arizona, and... Oh, you know what? I, I tried to show you that. I, I made a mistake when I um when I tried to show you that carbon core. Let me let me do it again. I, it was my fault. I'm not I'm not really comfortable with the 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 camera yet and the the software I'm using. Okay, it's my fault. Okay, do you see the carbon core now? You see what I'm talking about? I'm sorry. I I, I totally forgot to switch the camera over. I was looking at it on my screen. So that that's what I'm talking about. That that grayish. That grayish area on the inside of the clay. You see it now? That's what you call carbon core. That's that organic matter that didn't burn out. Um, so, um, yeah, I, so we have a lot of live oaks here in southern Arizona, and I've thought about um, using oak bark because I've seen it used other places, and I've heard about it. So um, someday I will do some experiments with oak bark. I'd love to. Um... Do you sell pigments that you have collected? And also, what plants do you use to make black pigment? Thank you. Um, 
No, uh, a lot of a lot of what I do, um, I I don't sell because I couldn't make any money on it. And I spend so much time harvesting and processing uh, minerals. Here's some um, red iron ochre that I just processed recently. This will be a video in two weeks. Look at the brightness on that. Isn't that great? And so, um, I, there's no way I could sell this for like, I, I'd be selling it for like, you know, some ridiculous, like $50 for an ounce or something. And it, I, I can't do that to people. I'd feel bad about it. So, um, you can buy red iron oxide off, you know, Amazon. And that's would be my suggestion if you can't get it in your area, because I can't do it for a reasonable price. And the same way with pookies. Honestly, I get a lot of requests for pookies. Um, and I, I just can't make a pookie and sell it for a price that would be reasonable for somebody. So make your own pookies or the ones they sell on New Mexico clay are really cheap. Were they like five bucks or something? Um, so I, there's a lot of things I don't, I don't make or don't sell because I can't at a reasonable price. I sell gourd scrapers and polishing stones. That's all I sell because I can sell those at a price that I think is relatively affordable. I, and I still you know, I make some money on it because it wouldn't be good for me to volunteer all my time to make tools for people and not get something back, right? I have to I have to pay bills just like everybody else. Oh, uh, what do I use to make black pigment? Um, I've used uh, you're talking about organic paint, I assume. Not a, well. There's two different ways you use organic material as, as in pigment. Uh, one is a, a organic binder uh, to to help the make your mineral paint uh, flow to make it sticky so it sticks on the pot so it flows off the brush uh, and then there's organic paint like um, this pot is painted with organic paint and when it fires that'll turn black right now it looks kind of yellowish and it's kind of glossy uh, because it's like syrup right and so um, I've used a lot of different things uh, traditional in the southwest is um, uh, Rocky Mountain bee plant, uh, but uh, you can use all kinds of different things. I think they use tansy mustard up at Hopi, and um, I've used sunflower, I've used mesquite beans, um, let's see, um, amaranth. I can't think. I've tried a bunch of uh, yucca fruit. I've tried a lot of different things. I don't think it matters. Find something in your area that you can boil down into gook. That's really that's really the case. Um, some pre-structure, no, I read that. Excellent live stream, says Tracy Spore. Thank you, Tracy. I want to watch, but I can't. I have to go. Sorry, Orwell. Um, peace and love. Your stuff is amazing. You do great. I am an art type of view. Peace and love. Love making them abstract. I wouldn't chance it. Uh, excellent live stream. Thank you, Tracy. Absolutely love your videos. You have inspired me to venture into other forms of pottery. Thank you. Zippy Tippy. Appreciate it. Uh, love and Tez, you're doing fine. Okay, I've got, uh, I've got about uh, 12 minutes or so. So let me show you uh, some of the other stuff I, I brought to discuss and never got to. So here we go. Uh, let's talk about some of this prehistoric pottery, all right? Uh, this is uh, this is Holcomb pottery. And uh, this is was made here in uh, southern Arizona. Uh, I don't know, you know, from like maybe 700 A.D. to 1300. I'm just... I'm not a Holocom expert, I'm just roughly. And so uh, a lot of people trying to make this, trying to reproduce this type of pottery over the years um, have struggled to get that buff colored clay because um, buff clay isn't generally found around here. In fact, if you go to the places where this type of pottery is common, like Tucson and Phoenix, uh, you cannot find buff colored clay uh, to save your life. Uh, turns out uh, that what they were actually had in their clay was caliche. So caliche is calcium carbonate. And I can do a video on, on caliche at some point. Um, caliche is, is white, um, sometimes very hard, but naturally occurring chunks in the soil. Sometimes it's a whole layer. Um, and generally you don't want to get calcium carbonate in your pottery because it can cause pops and spalls. Um, but they were actually grinding up caliche with the clay uh, and that was giving it that whitish color. Now the secret to using caliche in your clay and not causing your pots to explode is uh, as long as you keep the temperature under like, I don't know what it is, like 850 or 900 C. Uh, once you get over that point, then your caliche turns to quicklime, uh, you know, and, and then that can cause stalls. So uh, as long as you keep your temperature down, you can make this uh, caliche 
pottery and it makes that really nice buff clay which gives you a lot of contrast when you paint that red hematite on it like they do and I've got one more hole compot to show you here isn't that gorgeous look at the quality I really love the the combination of the thick line work and the really really fine line work inside those squares so that's a uh, hole compottery and the other thing interesting about hole compottery is that's made with uh, the paddle and anvil method which is not the way I construct pottery uh, but if you watch Tony Soares, uh, he's a friend of mine that he has a YouTube channel. So just if you go to YouTube and just type in Tony Soares pottery, uh, he he makes paddle and anvil pottery. Okay, uh, and here's another one that we talked about a little bit today. Uh, this is members pottery. Members pottery is interesting because it um, it's well, it's beautiful for one thing, and the subject matter is interesting because they did a lot of people and animals and you know scenes of mythology and those kind of things um, but uh, the other thing that's really fascinating about members pottery you, you can see if you look around you'll find a lot of people making reproductions of members pottery um, uh, P Pueblo people uh, you know Native Americans make uh, pottery with members designs on them and, and you know Anglo's and, and such who, who want try to do reproductions I know a number of them that have done a lot of these members designs but none of them as far as I'm aware are doing them correctly because members that black is actually red iron oxide that's actually hematite and it's fired in a reduction reducing atmosphere so that it turns black and so um, if you were making it correctly authentically um, you would be doing it in a reducing atmosphere and well, nobody really knows that I'm aware of how to do, how to fire it So what you find with members pottery a lot such as this jar here is where the black will actually turn red If it gets if it gets oxygen to it while it's firing it'll turn red So a lot of times it's even a combination like if you look at the far left of this jar It's kind of turning black on that side and then it kind of gradiates towards red on the side. We're looking at um, So they they were trying to reduce it and it had a failure, but really these these red ones, or the ones with a kind of a combination of red and black, are, are some of the most beautiful, in my opinion. And I have one more of these uh, to look at. This is the um, Western, let's see, uh, Western New Mexico University Museum, where they have a huge collection of members' pottery. So the interesting thing about this, well, besides the way it's fired, uh, it's it's just local, uh, like brown clay, uh, and then it has like a white, uh, maybe a kaolin or some kind of really nice bright white slip only on the inside of the bowl and then these really amazing designs and not only are they are they fascinating designs because of the subject matter you can see animals and people and uh, but they're really really finely executed they're really amazing fine line work so members pottery is is really uh, some of the finest in the southwest and and like I said nobody is really making it uh, correctly today Uh, let me go back to me. Um, okay, uh, Giordano Bruno. I'm sorry if I'm messing your name up. Uh, you're in Yuma, and can I find natural clay to work? Yeah, there is clay in Yuma. I I know people that you know that have made clay in the Yuma area, but I've spent so little time in Yuma that I I couldn't tell you. I'd look along the Colorado River. You'd probably have alluvial clay along that river. I would think. Um, but I'm, I'm just not super familiar with the Yuma area to tell you where to look. Um, how much more time do we have to complete the Ancient Pottery Challenge? I'm gonna wrap. I'm gonna try to wrap up the Ancient Pottery Challenge by the end of June, hopefully, or maybe into July. So this summer for sure. Um, and then I'll I'll do that wrap up video. You know, maybe July, July or August. So um, I would, you know, if if you want to do them all and you haven't you know and you're not well along you better get on it um, uh, Chris in Kansas says are most of these ancient pot paints mineral versus organic uh, so we looked at Holcom and members and Holcom and members this is that now this is what I was saying about members pottery Holcom and members pottery use exactly the same paint it's red iron oxide it's it's hematite and in fact uh, if you look at 
older members pottery it evolved out of they were making they were they were copying holocom pottery they were making red on brown pottery very similar to holocom pottery and then uh that evolved and they they discovered this white slip that evolved from red on brown to red on white and then they discovered this way to re reduce reduction fire their ox their red paint and it became black on white so it actually evolved out of pottery it was very similar to holocom so they both use mineral paint made out of red iron oxide. Um, I watched the video where you collected the clay and ground it dry. You said something about not separating the clay out since the temper may be added anyway. Will you elaborate on that? Well, sure. If I get clay out of the wild and it has some grit in it, most clays, wild clays have a certain amount of grit to them. They're not 100% pure clay. Uh, now, if you, if you purify, a lot of people go through a lot of process to purify their clay to get all the junk out of it which in some cases is good, but you're just, in some cases, you're just removing grit that you're then gonna, you have to temper your clay. I always add about 20% temper to my clay. So what is the point of going to a lot of effort to pull all that grit out of my clay so that I can turn around and put grit in my clay? That grit is naturally there as temper. Why not leave it in place? That's all I mean. Um, it's about 20% ratio for temper. Oh, Regina. So. Um, it's just a four to one. It's just a four to one ratio. So you can get any size scoop, right? Scoop out four scoops of clay and then one scoop of temper. And mix it together. That's that's a 20%. That's four to one ratio. Easy. That's 20% sand to 80% clay. Um, JD, thank you so much for the informative video. I had not touched clay prior to your videos. Excellent instruction. Thanks, JD. Uh, can you use kaolin powder white to make white slip? Yeah, I would. you could. Um, my question would be at what temperature that kaolin matures. So a lot of white clays have higher maturation temperatures before they harden and become ceramic. Uh, that temperature is high because because brown and red clays have natural fluxes in them. Iron is a natural flux, for example. And so that white clay, some of those white clays have a higher maturation temperature. So at the temperatures I'm reaching in my firings, um, you know, let's say I'm not going over 900 C, um, maybe that kaolin wouldn't turn to ceramic. I don't know. You would have to experiment with that. That would be my one uh, caveat to using kaolin. Can white clay, whiteware clay make good slip? Yeah, yeah, well, it, white clay make, I use it for slip a lot. And that is like around here, white clay is rare and when you find it it's often just a thin band so you can't really get enough to make a body clay out of so you build your clay out of brown or you build your pot out of brown or gray clay and then you slip it with the white because it's rarer it's more precious uh thanks for taking the time to let us ask you so many questions uh thanks anthony i appreciate you guys asking questions it made the live stream real easy for me today because i didn't have to make stuff up there were things i had out here to show you that I didn't even get around to because you guys had so many good questions. So that makes it easy for me. Uh, peace and love. Much love all time to get back to teaching. Thank you for the wonderful lunch live stream. Hope to see you again on live. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Peace and love. You too. Uh, Meredith Saunier. Good morning. Recently discovered the channel and have enjoyed watching it and learning. Keep up the great work. Thanks. Thanks, Meredith. I appreciate it. And Andrew Prost, is volcanic ash significantly better than wood ash for temper? Yeah, I, like I said, I wouldn't use wood ash for temper. I don't think that's going to be a positive thing. Volcanic ash is a great temper. Wood ash, having never used it, my opinion is, is not a good temper. But, you know, prove me wrong. Uh, Regina Carroll, the clay I've found has a good bit of silt. Does that work for temper? Uh, yeah, it can, but it also can ruin the, the, uh, the, the texture of your clay. It may not be very workable, so... It, it depends. You're going to have to test it. Try rolling some coils. Maybe make a little pinch pot. See if it uh, if it's working good for you. I mean, use it. If you feel like it's not plastic enough, and it, it just doesn't stay together good because it's so silky, then you're going to have to levigate to get that silt out. Uh, you know, and that's a time-consuming chore. But if it's good clay, or maybe the only clay in your area, then it's worth it. So, uh, I have a video coming out next Wednesday all about testing clay, new, finding new clays and, and the tests I go through to see if it's workable. So um, that should help a little bit. And you know, you just, every clay is different and every person's different. We all work a little different with our clay. So you have to find something that works for you.
Uh, and so that uh, that brings us to 10 o'clock. Uh, I appreciate all your questions and uh, uh, your participation. I didn't even use half of the material I had, so um, that's good. I can use it next time, right? Uh, everybody have a great weekend, and thanks for showing up. See you later.